So as we discussed earlier, assessment of the symptoms and not just looking at what our spirometry tells us. And they've developed several different tests, the COPD assessment test, CAT, a clinical COPD uh, questionnaire, and then the breathlessness measurement, which is the MMRC. And we're actually going to try to put those into a grid. Now, it's not going to be doable on an exam. So on an exam, we would have to go with just the spirometry. Um, so I'll show you kind of how we're going to do that later to, to get that right. But basically, when it comes to the medications, they're going to incorporate this type of questionnaire or patient symptoms into the grid of how to decide which medications are most appropriate for the patient. I'll give you an example of, of um, the MMRC, the next slide. So this is an example of the MMRC. Um, and it asks a lot of questions about breathlessness. Now you have different ones that you can use, but this is the one that's commonly used within the grid to help decide whether it's patient A, B, C, or D. So let's go through that a little bit and we'll discuss it. So this is well, what the assessment looks like when it's combined for COPD. And remember in the previous thing where we talked, or previous session where we talked about some things are worth repeating, well, it's looking at symptoms and looking at breathlessness and looking at risk and um, quality of life for the patient. And all of this is combined assessment for COPD. So it's a little bit like asthma in that if there's a, a high risk for that acerbation that throws someone in the hospital or that sends someone to the ER, then that makes a big impact on the, your treatment and how soon that you refer. So this is kind of what the combined assessment's gonna look like, and then I'm gonna break it down for you just a little bit more. Okay, so this is the combined assessment. And it's a little bit putting the cart before the horse because I haven't talked to you about the spirometry other than to say if the FEV1 FEC ratio is less than 0.7, then we have obstructive disease. So we've also talked about the fact that we need a combined assessment and not just the spirometry. So when you assess risk, you choose the highest risk according to the gold grade or acerbation history. And we talked about how important that was. If someone has been in the hospital <clears throat> based on their COPD from a severe acerbation, then that plays a big impact on your overall score. So patient A is gonna have low risk and less symptoms, and they're gonna be a gold one to two category. Uh, B is low risk, more symptoms, gold one to two. C is high risk, less symptoms, gold three to four. And then D is high risk, more symptoms, gold three to four. I know this doesn't make a lot of sense to you right now, so just hang in there. We're gonna add the spirometry, and then all of this is gonna to start to make just a little bit more sense for you. So when it comes to assessment, the first thing we're going to do, of course, is assess those symptoms. And you can use one of the scales that we talked about earlier, one of those three, to um, give you an objective measurement of the patient's symptoms. I mean, you don't have to give them the scale. You can just sit down and go through with them. You know, what, you know, can you get dressed without, you know, having any problems, getting short of breath? Can you walk to the mailbox? Uh, can you walk down the street? You know, ask them things like that. Um, in their normal everyday life and so you can get a good feel for their symptoms and the next thing that you're going to add is your spirometry so we know that we diagnose it with an fev1 fec ratio but then to grade it and decide our medication choices then we put it into four grade splits based on severity and that's going to be at 80 50 and 30 so i'm going to show you what that looks like
Okay, so this is your classification of severity. The first thing that you always have to do is you just have to look at that FEV1, FEC ratio. That's the first thing. Is this obstructive disease? Then if it is obstructive disease, how bad is it? Let's try to figure that out using the spirometry. Now, we've already talked about adding the symptoms in, but this is another objective measure that we have. So if you have an FEV1, FEC ratio less than 0.7, then you know you have obstruction. So then you start looking at your FEV1. If it's still above 80, then you're still in a mild stage. So that's gold one. So back on that previous slide when I said this is gold one or two, well, this is where that plays in. If your FEV1 is between 50 and 80, then it's gold two moderate. Between 30 and 50 percent predicted, gold three severe, and less than 30 percent percent predicted it's very severe and all these are based on that post bronchodilator FEV1 so remember we said we were going to challenge them with that short acting bronchodilator and see what happens and see if it's obstructive we're going to look at the ratio first and then we're going to start looking at the FEV1 so this is what we used to use is just these spirometry measures to kind of figure out medications the problem is we weren't really doing spirometry, so we're kind of left out there. So I know this is complicated to put all this together, but I think in a patient in real world, it's not going to be as difficult as it seems right now. Okay, so assessment. Again, assess your symptoms and then do your spirometry. Get your airflow limitation. The next thing you have to do is take into account those hospitalizations and those acerbations. So two acerbations or more within the last year or an FEV1 less than 50 are very high indicators of risk. Hospitalization for COPD acerbated, acerbation is associated with increased risk of death. So this is a very poor sign if they're having to go in the hospital, especially if when they get there, they're having to be ventilated. You've got to have a specialist on board to help you with these types of patients because they can get very sick very quickly. So the other thing that we need to assess is risk of acerbations. So to assess risk of acerbations, you use your history of acerbations as well as your spirometry. So two or more acerbations within the last year or an FEV1 less than 50% of predicted are uh, indicators of very high risk. So one or more hospitalizations for COPD should be considered to be a high risk patient. So once again, we're doing a combined assessment, so we're not just using spirometry to make decisions. We're also assessing the patient's symptoms, uh, their quality of life, and then again, the risk of acerbations. And the biggest deal about the risk of acerbations really is that's where we want to uh, add an inhaled corticosteroids. And we're going to talk about medications here in just a minute, but there's a reason that it's important to assess for risk of acerbations. Once you have diagnosed someone with COPD, always think about the comorbidities that are common with COPD, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, uh, respiratory infections, anxiety, depression, diabetes, lung cancer, and bronchiectasis, because these are going to influence your mortality as well as your hospitalizations. So it's very important to take uh, the holistic care of the patient because all of these do affect the COPD. When we're looking at differential diagnosis, 
you know, when someone comes in short of air and they're midlife and they're having sputum production and, and those sorts of things, there's, we're going to have a lot of differentials. You know, we're going to be thinking heart, congestive failure, COPD, especially if they're smokers, if they say that this has been ongoing since childhood, then we have to take asthma into account. Or if they say that they have uh, an aspirin allergy and seasonal rhinitis, I mean, there could be a lot of things that are going on. But basically, what gets hardest, I guess, between the differentials is looking at COPD and then looking at asthma. And the other thing that makes it extremely difficult is there is a huge overlap. And that's one of the things that the GOLD initiative has really assessed in the last couple of years. So I'm going to go through that with you because we're trying hard right now to learn asthma really well and to learn COPD. So just kind of a review of all of that again, I think will help. All right, COPD, onset in midlife, symptoms slowly progressive, long, long smoking history. <clears throat> That's your classic. Asthma, onset early in life, symptoms vary from day to day. Symptoms are worse at night, and usually it's 20% uh, change in their uh, PEFR. Allergy, rhinitis, or eczema is also present, and then family history of asthma. So like I said, one of the hardest things that, to differentiate between when you're doing your differentials is asthma and COPD. So um, they've actually developed something that helps determine the two. So let's talk about that for the next couple slides. All right, for an adult who presents with respiratory symptoms, you want to say, does the patient have chronic airway disease? Um, do they have a diagnosis of asthma, COPD, or is there a crossover between the two? You want to use your spirometry. You want to have initial therapy started based on what you think. And then also uh, specialized investigations are sometimes needed. We're not going to go into those. We're going to keep a primary care focus on this particular lecture. So the very first thing that we need to figure out, of course, is does the patient have chronic airway disease? Step two, we need to look at whether or not we're uh, dealing with asthma or COPD. And there can be a huge overlap. And because we're also studying asthma, I thought we could just go through this again. So asthma, usually before the age of 20, so these are your younger people. There's a variation, but it's over minutes, hours, or days. It's usually worse during the night or early morning triggered by exercise, emotions, dust, exposure to allergens. There's a variable airflow limitation, either with spirometry or peak flow. And lots of times there'll even be a considerable variation between um, daytime and nighttime for asthma. Lung function is usually normal between symptoms. Someone's usually told them that they had asthma or they had reactive airway disease or they have periods of wheezy bronchitis. There's something that someone's told them in the past that kind of makes them think about asthma. There's usually a big family history and also a lot of other allergic conditions like rhinitis or eczema. It usually doesn't worsen over time, although there may be a large variation seasonally. And then when you do your um, bronchodilator, they're going to have an immediate response to that, greater than 200 mLs uh, and 12% most likely. And then the chest x-ray would be normal. So contrast that to what your COPD patient would probably look like over the age of 40 and persistent symptoms even though you're treating them. Good days and bad days, but always the symptoms are there. So it's not like asthma where they're completely fine and then every spring they have an episode. This is a daily thing. There's chronic cough and sputum. 
There's onset of dyspnea, like with exercise, but it's unrelated to triggers like dust or emotions, that sort of thing. We can record persistent airflow limitations. So the FEV1, FEC ratio is less than uh, 0.7, and it kind of stays that way. Lung functions between symptoms is, is abnormal. So it's not like one day you do the spirometry and they're okay as long as they're not having an attack and then the next, you know, so it's it stays the same. Past family history of COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, heavy exposure to risk factors, tobacco, of course, being your main one. Symptoms slowly worsen over time. It's very progressive over course of years. And a rapid acting bronchodilator provides limited relief, so it seems to help, but it doesn't stay that way. And then the chest X-ray may or may not show anything. It may show severe hyperinflation at the later stages with COPD, but again, that may be completely normal. Okay, step three, perform spirometry. And what, what this is that I'm kind of talking to you about now is just still the diagnosis of asthma and COPD and which is which. Okay, one's reversible, one's not reversible. But when we do that FEV1, FEC ratio, they could both be less than 0.7. And that's because they're both obstructive diseases. Now, lots of times in mild asthma or intermittent asthma, you're not going to see a big change in your FEV1, FEC ratio, less than 0.7. But you may see a 5% change, something along those lines, in the moderate to severe. So don't get these mixed up. We're basically looking for, is there a big change when we give them that bronchodilator? Is there a change of at least 12% and at least 200 mLs? If there's not, then we're thinking it's more likely to be COPD. Something a little screwy going on with the slideshow right now. I'm not sure what it is, but all of that was to kind of get to this because to let you know that there is an overlap, to let you know that the patients look usually very different and on spirometry, they're going to act differently. The medications are going to be different. With asthma, you definitely don't want to ever give long acting beta agonist as a monotherapy absolutely can't do that because it increases the risk of sudden death. And when it comes to COPD, there's no reason to ever give just inhaled corticosteroids without a long-acting bronchodilator. So that's the kind of the difference is that there's, there's a lot of overlap with the medicines, but one, you never give a LABA monotherapy, and the other, you never give an ICS monotherapy. So be sure and know that. It's, it's very important. And again, this is still in the same little category of asthma versus COPD. And they're basically saying, you know, look for other things if what you're doing isn't working. If they have persistent symptoms or acerbations, even though you're trying to treat them, go ahead and refer. You know, don't forget about things like pulmonary hypertension, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, all those kinds of things. Um, asthma and COPD, you know, if they start having atypical or lots of other signs and symptoms, weight loss, night sweats, fever, you got to, you know, get some help with this and get a um, specialist in to help you out. So those are, would be reasons for referral. Okay, so now we're back to just COPD, talking about just COPD. Chest X-ray, it's seldom diagnostic, but it helps you rule out other alternative diagnosis. Um, like I said, they're rarely gonna walk in, the only thing that's ever gonna be wrong with them is COPD. I mean, they're gonna be probably in that category and have the risk factors for congestive heart failure and cardiovascular disease and all those other things. So chest X-ray isn't gonna say, hey, this is COPD. But it may say, hey, 
um, congestive heart failure. So it's something that you want to do and, and get a good baseline on. The lung volumes, that's going to be referral out, oximetry, and arterial blood gases. We rarely ever do arterial blood gases in primary care. And I know, like, if I put it on an exam, because you guys are all in acute care right now, that's going to be the first thing that you're going to choose is ABGs. Don't choose that, because really, if they're at the point where they need an ABG, which is their SAD is less than 92%, um, then you, this is a referral, okay? So use your pulse ox, and then, you know, that will help you figure out how immediate things are and whether or not you need to refer, but you're not going to do a lot of ABGs in your office. I can tell you that right now. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsine, we talked about when to do that. Uh, you want to do that screening when COPD um, develops in patients of Caucasian descent under the age of 45 or if they have a really strong family history of COPD. These are just some additional investigations that you can do, exercise testing. You're basically trying to figure out what's the prognosis of this patient. And I know everybody's different, but um, you know, doing exercise testing would at least let you know where they are at the moment so that you could then work with them with pulmonary rehab or home exercises or whatever you needed to to get them up and moving about. And composite scores just kind of take several variables. You have your FEV1 and then their symptoms and exercise tolerance and all those kinds of things. And whether or not they've had weight loss, like if they've had weight loss with COPD, that's a very ominous sign and that's, that's not good. So these are just different things and probably not going to be completed by you in primary care.